Hello, I'm Peter King, and welcome to the MMQB Podcast with Peter King, where I take you inside the minds of the biggest influencers in the NFL. This week, a trip out west for two guests, Rich Eisen of NFL Network and Jason Whitlock of Fox Sports. I asked Rich Eisen about his favorite interview of all time. Gil Garcetti was sitting in that seat when the whole OJ documentary hoopla was going on and having a full-on conversation with a man who was right in the middle of something so important to our culture was really awesome. Also this week, I asked Jason Whitlock about the future of NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. I think he's in a little bit of trouble, and I think he's been compromised by the controversies, but I'm, I haven't given up on him. I think he can rebound and pivot and move to a better place. Those conversations and my thoughts entering week seven of the NFL season coming up. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates anymore. If you want the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites. And now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. Find candidates in any city, any industry, nationwide. Just post once and watch your qualified candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy to use interface. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Quickly screen candidates, rate them, and hire the right person fast. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 1 million businesses. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. All you have to do is go to ZipRecruiter.com slash MMQB. Again, ZipRecruiter.com slash MMQB. One more time. It's free, folks. ZipRecruiter.com slash MMQB. Back on the MMQB podcast with Peter King. I'm here in Los Angeles at the studios of DirecTV with Rich Eisen, longtime NFL network czar (laughs) and host. And uh, Rich, I just did your show. We had a good time out here. Thanks for doing it. Yeah, sure. And, you know, I find your ascension really cool in our business because you've done it all thanks you know the staten island advance yeah that's right the chicago tribune and you were the sports editor of the michigan daily weren't you well i was one of them uh the year after schefter is that right yeah schefter schefter actually the year that schefter covered the basketball team is when glenn rice Won the national championship. Right. You know, I know you being a, an East Coast guy. Are you? A, you're not a Seton Hall guy, are you? Well, I, I lived near Seton right. Hall for 19 years. Right. But so yeah. you know, um, that was you know the year that Ramil Robinson beat you know PJ Carlissimo in, yeah. in Seton Hall with Glenn Rice. I drew the short straw, having to close the newspaper that night. You know, when when you used to of print out the articles yeah. and have to cut them with an exacto knife and stick them up onto yeah you know, whatever you had to run off to create a newspaper, I drew the short straw to, to close the, the sports section that night. And because nobody, everybody wanted a party if Michigan won, which they did. And I remember running across campus while everybody was running to the center to party. I had to go through all of them to get to the Michigan Daily to edit Adam Schefter's game story <laughs> and put it in the newspaper. So, yeah, I mean, and the Michigan Daily – was an incredible experience for me. Loved yeah. it. You know, I was a sports columnist, covered Bo Schembechler's final season there. My first game covering the Michigan football team was the the day when Lou Holtz and Notre Dame came in and Rocket Ishmael ran back the opening kickoffs of the game and the half, uh, second wow. half. Wow. And so I covered Bo's last season. I was at his final weekly um, uh, media session um, with the beat writers, um, in Ann Arbor when he was extremely um, nostalgic and waxing rhapsodic about Woody Hayes and Ohio State, you know, leading up to the Ohio State game that week. And we all found out the reason why he was so open and just sort of warm and fuzzy is because he knew it was his last game uh, on campus. And then I covered his last game here at the Rose Bowl 
where, God bless Bo, uh, Mr. Three Yards in a Cloud of Dust called for a fake punt against USC in the Rose Bowl, and it worked only to be called back for holding Bobby Abrams, who then played for many years in the NFL with the Giants, yeah. called for holding. Uh, a bow went nuts, threw his hel- uh, his visor down, his hat down, went ass over T. Kettle, got an extra 15 yards on top of it. Game was <laughs> over. But just to finish that story, I'll never forget that day being in covering the Michigan Daily in the Rose Bowl, being up there looking down at USC's defense and seeing number 55 run all over the field. I thought there were multiple number 55s that day, and it was Junior, Junior Sam. Sam. I've never seen anybody play a defensive game like that in my entire life. Wow. And sure enough, it was a first ballot Hall of Famer to be wow. that day. Harbinger of things to come. Yeah. Uh, with Rich Eisen here in Los Angeles. So, Rich, you just reported something exclusively that nobody in America knows. <laughs> you used to edit Adam Schefter. That's true. What kind of writer was Adam Schefter? Yeah, he was great. I remember always I tell Schefter this to his face. I remember being jealous uh, because, you know, uh, he had a special kinship with Mitch Album at the time. Like yeah. Mitch took Adam under his wing, and we always knew Adam was going places, always. So he was an excellent writer. He was mm. great. And Adam's just a, a great person. You know him for many, yeah, many years. He's one well, of my favorite yeah. people that I met in the business. It broke my heart when uh, he left. NFL, NFL Network, Network for, lost him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's only been a couple of times I've ever called up management to say, look, I've got to keep two this cents. guy. Yeah. Yeah. He, was, he was one of them. Yeah. But he was terrific. You know, I, yeah. I loved working with him. So I, I did that at, in college at Michigan. And the other thing I did that, that was crucial to my – uh, my future was I did stand up comedy there. Uh, wow! Once a month, uh, I did not know years. that. Yes, I did stand up comedy, which made anything that I've ever done in broadcast TV or now you're sitting on the set of the TV radio show makes it that much easier. Nothing's more nerve wracking than going in front of a an audience. Do you ever get booed? Um, no, I never got booed, but I got sometimes just like no reaction, and it right. was really which is the same as being booed. I isn't guess it? in a way, yeah. <laughs> but like that prepared me for you know live TV and Sports Center and things that I'm doing right now. Uh, to the point where, you know, I do miss doing anything in front of a live audience. Like, it's not the job of the people who work on this show to laugh openly at right. my attempts at humor. I just miss the immediate feedback. So when Adam was doing his thing with Mitch Album, I would be doing my thing doing stand-up comedy. Were, were you a joke guy or were you funny story guy? Um, and I, did you do uh, your own? Funny story guy. My big finale um, was something that I... I Kind of ripped off. There's not kind of. I did from <laughs> from uh, a buddy of mine who I went to high school with, who's now currently on Fox News, uh, James Rosen. Um, so it's interesting that a guy who would cover the White House for many years, as he did now currently the State Department, would come up with this idea that uh, if you remember the old Penthouse magazine, Peter, there would be these. I wouldn't know anything okay, about sure, that Rich. because you read it for the articles, or <laughs> there were these letters to the editor, the forum letters that would be about people talking about their sexual exploits. That there was. Uh, something that would be always that they never thought would happen to them. I, re- <laughs> I read those articles in Howard Cosell's voice. <laughs> that was my big That's finale. That's very good. Yes, very like, good. I never thought this could happen to me. You know, like, <laughs> and I went up on stage with it. And, and then the one time where I got no reaction, I just looked up and it was uh, – Somebody brought like their seven or eight year old nephew. Oh to this no, thing. no, like, no! I don't have the heart to go fully into it. <laughs> of course, my fraternity brothers would always love that bit because I would then bring home the uh, the prop, you know, and bring that back to the uh, bring home the magazine. And it was always just a lot of fun doing that then. And like I said, it it just prepared me for the live performance, if you will, of what I do, you know, what I did back on sports and where I thought everything was a joke when I first started there. And then, you know, now what I do here. So you go from the Staten Island advance to the Chicago Tribune and then you go do TV. Well, the Tribune is what I, I, I did for just paying bills or just getting um, groceries when I went to Northwestern for graduate school. Okay. Cause I, I, I worked for the Staten Island advance out of college Three years, uh, did that, did just news, not sports. Uh, had an epiphany behind the wheel one day when I was covering the cops beat, and they would, you know, I was like a backup cops reporter, and they would give me this walkie talkie, would blurt out all sorts of codes. And, you know, I always thought the code that I was getting, I would, it would be like a triple homicide that I was missing. Instead, it was probably like a cat in the tree. But anyway, an ambulance zoomed by, and I, I, I literally followed it through red lights and followed it. And I thought to myself, there's no way to parse what I'm doing other than ambulance chasing. And Schefter, 
and a couple other guys that I went to school at Michigan went to Northwestern for their graduate degree in journalism. And I'm like, if Schefter can do it and these other guys can do it, I want to do it. So I wow. did. I went there. So I would string for the Chicago Tribune. I right. uh, went to places like uh, Wheeling, Illinois, and other places around town, uh, Chicagoland, uh, high school football. And I would call in the stats. Wow. For the Chicago Tribune, um, I may have written something, one or two things for them, but you know, always put that on my resume, yeah. and then went from there to CBS News for a summer internship. That was the summer of OJ's preliminary trial, and it was the f- one summer that Dan Rather and Connie Chung co-anchored the CBS Evening News. Wow! So I worked in the fishbowl, as they called it there. Uh, and I remember I would I would be answering telephones and thinking there's got to be something more to do, especially since there was an intern who kept on going out on the road with her uh, mentor, uh, Dr. Bob Arnott was the uh, 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 health reporter for CBS Evening News, and she would always go on the road with him, and she'd be doing all these exciting, exotic uh, news stories and adventures outside of the building, and I got stuck answering the phones, and that, that intern was named Melissa Stark. Wow. So I met her back in 1994. We were interns to get Schefter, and I worked in a newspaper together in college, and Melissa Stark and I were interns yeah. at the same time at the CBS Evening News. And I went and I got a, a gig in Redding, California from there doing sports, and ESPN found me at the local affiliate that by the way I've got a Rich Eisen show radio affiliate in Redding California now wow. so it's pretty neat wow so you do sports center yeah then you do NFL network and you've done everything in TV but the thing that I think is interesting for uh maybe even for like journalism students is that you've always done everything you know, you were one of the first people to do podcasts early. Mm-hmm. You, you did a podcast like six or seven years ago. Yeah, I 2010. Think. I mean, that's, I mean, no one knew what a podcast was then. Mm-hmm. So, what would be if you're standing in a classroom yeah. and you have students in the palm of your hand, what's your advice to them? My advice to them is be themselves and never take no for an answer and, and use the 21st century to their um to their advantage and by that i mean this you know you look around right now and you see that local tv sports departments are shrinking that it, it's just a small small operation where it used to be massive operations same with local newspapers as well and you see that and i i hear from a lot of young um kids that you know, there's not enough jobs and they're nervous about getting a job. And that might be true. But I also wish when I was looking for work that I had the opportunity of shooting my own stuff and posting it to YouTube. I wish that there was a Twitter account that I could have had, even though it was a small number of followers that you could build up. I wish I had that opportunity. I wish I had the opportunity to be able to do a podcast on my own. I would have done that. 100% 100% I would have gotten a setup. I would have done and just kept on pushing it out and sending the links, emailing a link as opposed to knocking on the door of a news director, which I did many times. I sent tapes ahead and road tripped. I did that in upstate New York um, trying to look for work. I remember I, I sat in the lobby of a, of, a, of a station, also did this in Nevada. Uh, in Las Vegas. I remember I went to Las Vegas, tried to get a, a gig from there when I was up in Reading. Um, I sat in the lobby an entire four hours waiting for the news director to come out and take me. I was the only time I've watched an episode of Matlock from start to finish because that was what was on the local TV show, the TV that was in the in the lobby at the time. You know, now you don't have to do that. Now you can email, but obviously you have to make sure that somebody's seeing this stuff. Never take no for an answer. Just keep on using the opportunities that technology today affords. You could do your own show. You could be your own sportscaster, your own website, your own podcaster. And it's kind of exciting. With podcasting, I mean, you, you've seen it. You're doing it right now. It's, it's not as if you don't have enough to do in your, your, right. in your career, in your life. You've got a lot going on. But it's a forum in which you can have conversations like I that. I think here's the reason why I've really grown to love this. Would I ever have 37 minutes with Drew Brees during the season Shh, nope. just to talk to him? But – and I, I basically tell people a lot of times when I'm going to do the podcast, it'll be 20 minutes or as long as you want it to be, you know. But, I mean, Drew Brees, we're talking about his son and the importance of playing flag football, why he thinks flag football is so important. 
uh, so that you can actually learn how to love football before you start getting hit. 